Welcome to Occupational Neurology for the Primary Care Provider. My name is Dr. Jonathan Rutchick, and today's focus will be post-concussion syndrome. This will be the first of three segments that each will be less than 10 minutes long. I am a physician in the San Francisco Bay Area, and I practice both neurology and occupational medicine, and I'm affiliated with the University of California at San Francisco. This is a picture of me in my EMG lab. <clears throat> my background includes board certification and residency training in neurology, as well as board certification and residency and fellowship training also in occupational environmental medicine. I have also completed a master's in public health, and I practice in the Bay Area. My practice also includes teaching residents and fellows and students at UCSF. My offices are in San Francisco, Richmond, and Petaluma weekly and monthly in Sacramento and once every three or four months in the Humboldt County area. My practice includes neurology consultation, electromyography, evaluations and workers' compensation, that is QMEs and AMEs, as well as IMEs for fitness for duty, as well as personal injury and toxic tort in the neurotoxicology realm. Uh, I do both plaintiff and defense work and as well as toxicology, uh, my work includes safety sensitive position assessments for commercial drivers, firefighters, and peace officers, those with neurologic conditions. So today's discussion will be post-concussive syndrome. And again, this will be one of, this is the first of three segments. <clears throat> in the first segment, we'll have a case presentation and we'll talk about clinical pearls in the neurological exam for the next three sessions. In the first session, we'll talk about pupils, hearing, and facial asymmetry the second eye movements, vertigo, seizures, and headache classifications, as well as treatments, and the third many years versus migraine, the troublesome patient, depression, and unusual sequelae. So our patient is a 50-year-old female trucker. She has a medical history of smoking, depression, and minor head injury. She was involved in an MVA, and she did strike her head. The occupational history is that she was in construction, she presented in the emergency room with a seizure. She had a negative CAT scan and a negative MRI. She was placed on Dilantin as well as narcotics. So there are a number of presenting symptoms that come up. The patient in the first week had a seizure. She had nausea. She had dizziness and vertigo, difficulty with vision and hearing, as well as facial numbness. In the first month, she had other symptoms, including headache, tinnitus, balance, sleep disturbance, depression, and sexual dysfunction. The initial concerns really are are any of her complaints suggestive of a subacute subdural, that is one that does not picked up on the CAT scan or the MRI, or could she have had a tumor stroke or vascular lesion? Those mainly would have been picked up by an MRI. So is the facial numbness and vertigo a brainstem sign? Is the nausea a meningeal sign? Could the visual or hearing complaint suggest a new occipital or temporal lobe hematoma? Or could these be old, suggestive of an occupational sensory neural hemorrhaging loss or a newly uncovered presbyopia? Do the histories of depression or the history of depression and prior head trauma suggest that she may have delayed recovery? Does the smoking history suggest that there's an addiction personal or addictive personality? And could this suggest that narcotics are, would be a problem going forward? And lastly and importantly, does she have a seizure? The exam reveals flatness of affect, poorly responsive pupils on the left, a Weber sign basically suggestive of the right or a Weber that refers to the right, mild facial weakness on the right with facial sensation loss on the right and nystagmus noted on the left lateral gaze. Motor exam was normal, sensory exam reduced sensation in the entire right hemi body but symmetrical reflexes. The Romberg exam, the Romberg exam was also abnormal. Musculoskeletal system revealed tenderness in the right temporal area, clicking in the right jaw, maxillary sinus tenderness on the life on the, on the right as well as trapezius tenderness. The range of motion in the cervical spine was mildly limited. So considering the pupils, could this be new or old? Associated with ptosis, or small and irregular, or possibly an 80s pupil, which might be in a young female, which includes reduced reflexes, a lack of sweating, and autonomic instability. This brings us to our first uh, visual. So you notice that in, in A, the uh, patient's left eye is larger. And that would be the 80s pupil. In B, it was the left eye responds poorly to indirect light. In C, it responds poorly to direct light. 
In D, it does in fact constrict with near uh, gaze, and in E, it does relax uh, after near gaze. Looking at this algorithm, very helpful, you notice on the left, there would be a good light reaction, and that helps us, put us puts us in categories of either physiologic anisocoria or a Horner syndrome, depending on if the anisocoria is greater in the dark or light. If there is no good light response, one could be an 80s tonic pupil, or the other could possibly be a third cranial nerve palsy, either partial or complete. A complete third nerve palsy would be likely related to a vasculopathy or an aneurysm, but it could be isolated. <clears throat> the uh, partial third nerve palsy could be consistent with trauma or surgery or an infection, or possibly other things like iris damage, as you note in the far right column. So abnormal hearing, uh, if the patient has an abnormal a Weber that points to the right, then it may very well reveal sensory nerve and hearing loss on the opposite side, or possibly a conductive abnormality in that right ear. A Rene test assesses air conduction versus bone, and if both are decreased, this suggests reduced sensory neural hearing loss. Or I should say, if both are reduced, that would suggest sensory neural hearing loss. Patients who have trauma near the ear may have a labyrinthine concussion, and they may suffer from sensory neural hearing loss, sensory neural hearing loss, for some time. And in fact, one third have persistent problems, but vertigo usually resolves in three months. With regards to facial paralysis, the key here is determining whether it's of central or peripheral localization. In A, one notices that only the lower aspect of the face is weak, the nasolabial fold, that is, and that's an upper motor neuron lesion, possibly or probably from the, upper, from the opposite side. In B, one notices the entire uh, musculature of the forehead as well as the face, the lower part of the face is paralyzed, and that would suggest a lower motor neuron facial or a same side, seven cranial nerve palsy. So this is a photo or a picture of the anatomy of the seven cranial nerve, and one can see that hyperacusia is consistent with a seven cranial nerve palsy. Neurologists often do blink studies, and this is, a, is a, uh, an image of a direct facial nerve study where the right ha has a much faster and larger latency than the left. Uh, suggestive of a left direct facial nerve palsy or a seventh cranial nerve palsy. <clears throat> this would be a complete blink study suggesting that the, this would demonstrate a left efferent seventh nerve palsy. Uh, to the viewer's right, one stimulates the left supraorbital area and you notice that the ipsilateral R2 is slow. Again, supporting the efferent seventh nerve problem. When you stimulate the right side, you notice the contralateral R2 is slow, again, consistent with the left efferent seventh nerve palsy slowing. So that would be the end. This concludes seg segment one of three, uh, occupational neurology for the primary care provider, uh, the focus of post-concussive syndrome. Uh, I will encourage the viewers to now search for segment two of three, uh, with, of the uh, same title. Thank you very much. Again, I'm Dr. Rechik, Neurology and Occupational Medicine, San Francisco Bay Area.